uh, because not only uh, did we have commission installation of our new deaconess, Mrs. Jen Sukula. Round of applause, please, at the early service. Late service people, we're going to commission and install her twice. So you'll get to see and participate as well. That was at her request. Uh, and I searched the rubrics, Dr. Busher. I couldn't see that, that anything was wrong with that. So you'll just, you may be the only deaconess in the history of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod to be commissioned and installed twice. <laughs> Okay, but like baptism, it's probably the first one that took, so, okay? All right, we have with us as well uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, James Busher uh, here from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, he is the director of uh, Deaconess Studies and also a professor up there. I don't know your really long title of the chair you hold, so I'm not no, even going to take important. a stab at it. It's in the bulletin, though. Okay. <laughs> is it rolling? Okay. It is, yeah, okay. So Dr. Busher is um, also kind of a son of the congregation in the sense that his mother, Mary Busher, is a, a member here, longtime member, as well as his sister, Mrs. Lois Dooms, uh, and her husband, Pete. Uh, so a lot of family connections. You've mm. been here before, uh, yeah. but very good to have you uh, back with us today. Late service people, you're in for a real treat because uh, we had Dr. Busher preach today, and uh, just what a, what, a, what, a, what a blessing. He's been one of your professors, obviously in deaconess studies. I've had you for my doctoral work, mm -hmm. and um, you are a blessing yeah. to the church, sir, and we really appreciate all that you do. Okay? Uh, you. A couple of quick announcements. If you turn around and crane your head in the back, there is a cake, a deaconess cake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a deaconess cake. I don't know what flavor deaconess cake is. Sweet. Lemon blueberry. Lemon blueberry. Oh, nice. The blue. Yeah, blueberry matches your deaconess outfit. Nice. Um, so what we're going to do here this morning, um, we've obviously got the church picnic uh, later on today. And let's see, Mr. Chairman, there was something else I was supposed to announce before I turn it over to our new deaconess. Well, I don't know where he went, so that's okay. Okay, we had a big wedding yesterday. That's why you see some chairs and tables. All that stuff will be picked up. Uh, dance floor is up here. It was, it was just a beautiful, wonderful wedding. Uh, so thanks be to God for all that. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and I'm going to turn it over to our new deaconess, and she's going to share with you what a deaconess is and does. Uh, and don't forget to invite Dr. Busher up uh, to fill in anything and tell stories about, you know, your days as a student. Um, oh, before we pray, one other thing. Our new deaconess has more academic degrees than anybody we have on staff here at church. I'm just going to brag on you a little bit. So undergrad, master's, and doctorate. She actually has her doctorate, has been teaching music, specifically trumpet at several of our local universities, and then decided to go back to school uh, for a life of service to the church, and, uh, and is still doing a little bit of teaching, although liberal academia really. has been driving you nuts. Yeah. Um, and so now she has a, additionally a master of arts in religion that she has uh, completed over the course of the last two years. Um, and so you, we, we are very blessed here uh, with very uh, intelligent, well-educated staff and uh, really looking forward to serving with you. Thanks, Pastor. Okay. Are you nervous? No. No. Good. All right. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Almighty God, you chose the Virgin Mary to be the mother of your only Son. Grant that we who are redeemed by his blood may share with her in the glory of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, deaconess. All right. Um, how many people have heard of a deaconess or have been in a church with a deaconess before? Okay, quite a few. Uh, a lot of times when I say I'm a, I was going to school to be a deaconess, people had no idea what that meant, even in the Lutheran church. I really never had heard of one until I was in my 20s when Advent got our first one. Um, a few years ago, and so I'm just going to talk very briefly a little bit about what a deaconess in the LCMS does. Um, first, I'm going to start with the, the uniform, which we lovingly call the garb. So I don't know why they picked blue. I guess it's to make us stand out against the pastors who are usually in black, but we always have the cross insignia on our shoulder. And does anybody notice what color I used to have? Blue, and now it's gold, because I'm done. Um, and you can see here the little description of what the cross means. The arms of the cross stretch out to the four directions of the compass and are each inscribed with the fish symbol, you can see, that meets in the center. 
The letters of the Greek word fish are an acrostic for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. Early Christians used this symbol as a means of identifying one another during times of persecution. The arms of the cross also flare into the shape of Easter lily blossoms, symbolizing the radiant joy of the resurrection of Christ, the, so the source of Christian hope. And also notice that the insignia is on the left arm closest to the heart of the deaconess. Um, I wasn't like super pumped about the idea of wearing a uniform when I found out about that, um, but in our classes we read this great book by a hospital chaplain and he talked about uh, how he would go to the hospital every week to see this one person who was there, I think he was a member of his church, and it, he was sharing a room with a woman who was, you know, as far as he could tell, totally out of it, didn't even know he was there. And so for months at a time, he would visit this one, talk to this one guy. He didn't even talk to the person who seemed to be in a coma because she wasn't responding. And then one day after months, he walked in the room and she was alert and sitting up and she said, pastor, pastor, come here. And he went over and she said, I just want to let you know that I loved your visits so much. And he was like, what? You even, you knew I was even here? And she said, I just saw the uniform, the pastoral uniform, and I was reminded that God is still with me. And so that, I read that story and I was like, all right, I get it. So you won't see me in this all the time, um, but when you do, it's a reminder that God is with you and he is working through the hands of the church to serve you. So what is a deaconess? Pastor Frederick William Hertzberger, he was an early advocate for starting a deaconess program in the US. This is like around 1911. He described it as trained and officially employed women workers in the church as assistants of the holy ministry. The LCMS website says LCMS deaconesses are women who are professional church workers trained to share the gospel of Jesus Christ through a ministry of works of mercy, spiritual care, and teaching the Christian faith. The word uh, deaconess comes from diakonos, which means servant. The first deaconess is often thought to be Phoebe, and we read about her in Romans 16, verses 1 through 2, where Paul commends to the church of Rome, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Senecrie, Senecrie, so that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So Phoebe uh, was likely the one who delivered the, apost the Romans apostle to the Roman, or the epistle to the Romans. Um, and so here we have the idea, the concept of a deaconess in the Bible, a woman who is serving the church and she's helping those in need. But in the Lutheran church, um, especially in LCMS, the deaconesses took a while to come around. I'm gonna give you a really brief history of deaconesses in the Lutheran church. So deaconesses served in the Lutheran church since the 1830s in a variety of roles, but it wasn't until 1922 that the first deaconesses started serving in the LCMS. So I think LCMS started in 1847, that right? Um, and so they didn't get their first deaconess in the LCMS until 1922. Took a while to come around. In 1919, the Lutheran Deaconess Association, which was a pan-Lutheran organization, um, they, were start, they started and they started training deaconesses. And between 1919 and 1935, all deaconesses were trained as nurses. And they were trained in hospitals, and in institutions. So that, per, that Pastor Hertzberger, who I quoted right at the beginning, I said he was an early advocate, he wanted to get deaconesses trained in the US. Finally, in 1980, the LCMS opened its first synodical deaconess training program in Chicago, at Concordia University in Chicago. And the CDC, the Concordia Deaconess Conference, um, was formed in 1980. So if you know your LCMS 
LCMS history that has to do with the things that were going on with Seminex. So the first organization I talked to you about, the Lutheran Deaconess Association, I said it was pan-Lutheran, started to go towards the ELCA way. And so the ladies of the um, Concordia Deaconess Conference, they were holding true to the confession um, of the LCMS church and not wanting to stray with those who were going with ELCA. And so they made a confessional deaconess conference. It's pretty interesting. Some of the, those ladies are still alive, and we had to read a book about them, and they were pretty, they held their own. They, they sounded like really cool ladies. So then in 2002, Concordia and St. Louis started a graduate level deaconess program, and in 2003, Fort Wayne started their program. So while deaconesses originally worked as nurses in a bunch of different roles, now they focus on mainly three um, areas, congregations, missions, and institutions. So obviously I'm focused on the congregational setting, so here's a few ways that I can serve you. Visiting the, shut in, the sick, the shut-in, the imprisoned, teaching Bible studies, Sunday school, VBS, and leading devotions, caring for members in your time of need, um, for funerals, during illness, um, all kinds of things, giving instruction, admonition, and the comfort of God's word as a situation requires, and fostering fellowship in the church. Serving in the mission field, these are a few ways to serve in the mission field. Foreign and domestic locations, planting churches, supporting education, and working with, closely with pastors. This is that list continued. Now, I don't know a lot about what the deaconesses do because I don't have experience in the mission field, but in my cohort we have two ladies who are serving in the Dominican Republic as missions. And the things I heard them talk about, first they were both nurses, and they would make wellness checks to people, they would care for all the members of the congregation, health and spiritual, and the other missionaries, they would serve them with health checks and checking in on them, how are they handling things. Um, they do, one girl does a lot with the strengthening and supporting the Lutheran family and living out God's design. So in the Dominican Republic, they have an issue with like men having multiple families. And so they're trying to teach people what is marriage? What is the sanctity of marriage? What is the sanctity of life? Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm not a nurse and Probably if somebody got a paper cut right now, I'd throw up. So I don't know a lot about that area of it. Um, and then deaconesses may assist an ordained pastor in providing spiritual care for those in hospitals, prisons, retirement communities, and facilities that care for people with developmental disabilities. So there's a wide variety of ways you can serve as a deaconess. I'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. But first, what is a deaconess not? Because when people try to, when I say I'm a deaconess and people don't know what that is, then they start guessing, and it's usually not right. And so a deaconess is not ordained into the office of holy ministry. Um, but it, a lot of times, like if I go to a hospital or a retirement home, they see the uniform and they think I'm a, a female pastor. They let me right in so I don't say anything. Um, we are not given the authority to hear a confession and give absolution, preach, or distribute the Lord's Supper. Um, but I will tell you that I will always point you, God willing, I will always point you to those things. Um, and if you come and talk to me, which I hope you feel comfortable doing, I will be honest with you if it's a situation that I feel you need to go talk to pastor about this. Um, and always pointing to word and sacrament. And deaconesses are not acting in the place of a pastor. This next one might sound kind of funny. We're not in a religious order like the Roman Catholic nuns. But if you look at this picture, so this is an old, I don't know when this picture was taken, but you can see they're actually wearing, they look like nuns, don't they? They look like they're wearing a habit. 
Um, and I told you that it was 1922 until the, the LCMS got their first deaconess. Um, and so I think there was some stigma there that people did think that there was some kind of relation between um, the Catholic nuns and deaconesses. And you know, the old Lutheran saying, that's too Catholic. Um, and so there was pushback on it. There's also fear that maybe people were trying to get women into the ministry. Um, and I think really early on in the deaconess history, they were not permitted to marry. So it really looked like they were nuns then. But it's not like that now, obviously. Hi, there's my husband and my child. Um, and a deaconess is not a director of Christian education or a director of Christian outreach, a director of family ministry, or a director of church ministries. I had never even heard of these terms until I got into the deaconess program because, again, I'd never been in a congregation with any of these people that I was aware of. Um, but my understanding is these are all called workers, and um, their title describes what they do. So if they're a Lutheran teacher, they're a director of Christian ed, it really describes what their main function is. Um, there can be overlap in the jobs, like I could do some things that some of these people do and they could do some things that I do, but they have very specific title that describes what they do. A deaconess, um, a deaconess is much broader in what she can do and it's really based on her interests, her strengths, um, for example, some of the people who came to the 55 plus group on Wednesday met Camille, who is a deaconess who um, focuses on deaf ministry. Uh, we have people in my class, we have a counselor, who was previously a counselor, a psychiatrist, um, Deaconess Rast, who is, works with Dr. Busher, um, is a social worker in a previous life. Um, what else? Lots of different things. Yeah, so you, a teacher, yeah, a Lutheran teacher. So you get a lot of different backgrounds, and that, I think that kind of guides people what direction when they become a deaconess. You know, if they're a teacher, they might go do a lot of the youth things and focus on that. Um, but it's, there's a lot of things you can do. Like, here's a more in-depth list. So human care and the aging and continuing care, those are a lot of the things I've been doing during my internship, and I've really enjoyed those parts of it. Um, as I get into it, I wanna do definitely more of the women's programs, youth programs. Uh, my background is in music, so, I mean, I've always kind of done music around here. I do, you do not want me doing the choir. Um, I'm a trumpet player, but, um, and then we have our school started, starting now, and so a deaconess is a great place to get into the education element of it, too. So this is from the LCMS website, if you want to go, if anybody's interested. And, they, and what they say about this list is, um, this is a list of some ways that deaconesses may serve, but it is not limited to these areas. A deaconess may have additional special skills or interests beyond those listed here. And some of these items could even de be developed into one whole area of responsi responsibility. So a deaconess isn't necessarily going to do all of these things. Um, she could be really specific on something, or she could do a little bit of everything. So what motivates Christians to serve others? Uh, Dr. Busher's sermon today was really great for telling us why we serve others, and it was a great synopsis of the last class we had with him. You should have just given that and then given us the rest of the week off. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> um, but I'm going to read this, this quote from Deaconess Amy Rash. She's the Associate Director of Deaconess Formation, and I think it really, she states it really well. So mercy is central to who God is as evidenced in the Father's compassionate giving of his Son, in Christ's bearing of our sins and his sacrificial work on the cross for us, and in the faith-creating and sustaining work of the Spirit, mercy is a way of life for God's people. As they respond to his mercy and faith toward him and in love toward one another, 
Therefore, mercy is central to the life of a deaconess as she attends to the physical needs, shares God's word, teaches the faith, encourages believers in the Christian life, consoles the suffering, confronts the sinning, and tells the good news of salvation. So, in a nutshell, God showed his great love and mercy for us by sending Jesus to die for our sins. Christ willingly went to the cross so that we could become children of God through him. And as God's children, we bear the fruits of his mercy and his love as well. So this was in the bulletin. Um, this is one of the deaconess mottos. And it does, it does a good job, I think, explaining what we do. So what is my want? I want to serve. Whom do I want to serve? The Lord and his wretched ones and his poor. And what is my reward? I serve neither for reward nor thanks, but out of gratitude and love. My reward is that I am permitted to serve. And if I perish in this service, if I perish, I perish, said Queen Esther. I would perish for him who gave himself for me, but he will not let me perish. And if I grow old in this service, then shall my heart be renewed as a palm tree, and the Lord shall satisfy me with grace and mercy. I go my way in peace, casting all my care upon him. That's pretty much it. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I'll get back to you on that. Um, right now I've been doing a lot of the human care things, um, visiting some shut-ins. Um, I'd like to do more women's programs also and work with the youth more. So I don't really have the one area of expertise besides music. Um, so I'm kind of interested in just kind of dabbling in all areas. And, and with the school, I am not a school teacher. I think you guys are awesome that do that. I do not have classroom management skills. I taught college, so it was like, if you annoy me, go away. <laughs> um, so I don't want to teach that, but I do want to be visible to the children, and I want, to, I want them to know who I am and see me on a regular basis and know that I'm someone that they can come talk to um, if the pastor seems too big and scary. Um, or, or they're just a girl that wants to talk to another girl, you know, so, yeah, Amanda. Yeah, we've got some of the fellowship stuff going, and I have ideas for that also when I dig in, yeah. Ed. Oh. <laughs> so probably, uh, I don't know what's on the roster exactly. It's probably around uh, 50 to 200 uh, things. But uh, don't hold me to that. But I think my best kind of guess is that I'm working around it. But, uh, yeah, Steve. Oh, um, well, Pastor Feeney planted the idea in my mind whenever I was thinking about a master's. He was like, come up to Concordia with me. So that would have been 2009, eight or nine. Um, he's like, come to Concordia with me. And there's lots of single guys. <laughs> and I was like, my pastor's just trying to get me married. This is weird. So I didn't go with him. Um, but then I didn't know what a deaconess was, and he kind of planted that in my mind, and it just kind of rattled around in there, and then I ended up getting a an, an grad assistantship for grad school, and so that took me that way, but it was always kind of there, um, and then I started listening to Issues Etc. a lot, highly recommend it if you don't listen to it, um, and learning a lot. And I guess the really big turning point was when my daughter was born. And, you know, kids can change your whole perspective on things. And that's kind of when I decided that was the way to go. Yeah. 
Well, if you ever want to talk, my office is right in the main office. You can get in through the main office or through the outside way. It says Deaconess Cry Room. Um, so you can cry if you want, but you don't have to. I might. And that's pretty much all. Do we want to do this? Yes. Uh, two, two questions I'll just follow up on real quick because we have something special we're going to do here. Hold on one second with that. Uh, you asked the question, what is Jen going to do here at Advent? And that's a great question. And if you've been involved the last two years, some of you might be able to see a little bit about what our vision is for the future. So she has been our own intern here for the last two years and has been a very busy intern. Her first year, we were coming out of COVID, so we didn't have a lot of activities. So she spent working with every board and committee that we have here at church to learn and understand our structure to identify strengths, weaknesses, to do a SWOT analysis for you corporate folk, uh, smart goals, that sort of thing. And then she replied back to me at the end of each, uh, uh, each term semester, or semester uh, with a lengthy report. And so that was very helpful for us, not only in leadership, but for her to learn the congregation. Her second year then, this last year, was a very busy year. Um, the first thing I asked her to do was uh, you know, we have a growing segment of those of you, I'm starting to get it, that have these odd colored hairs on your face and your head. Um, and some of you are retired or thinking about retiring. That demographic here at Advent is really growing and getting ready to explode. And so I simply said to our young deaconess intern, hey, I want you to connect with these folks and get them together because, you know, we want to help people make connections at the same time We've had many of you that have retired or moved to the area and don't know anybody, and church should be a wonderful opportunity for fellowship and for connecting folks, not just for finding a good husband, you found one, um, but uh, also for building relationships. And so she started the 55 plus group, which is going very strong, uh, doing quite well. And then this last spring, she started our young professionals group, um, and that's been going strong and taking off. So already she's been working in those two very specific areas. Don't know what the role will be with our new school. Um, you know, I've always had a, a vision, as some of you have heard, for a, a musical academy alongside of our school and our church. I've dropped her a few hints and a couple other, because we are very blessed with some very educated and degreed musical people. And I would love for families to drop their kids off here for lessons. And instead of playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, play A Mighty Fortress is Our God or <laughs> Jesus Loves Me or something like that. Um, so we'll see how all this comes together. Jen right now is going to be part-time, at least for this current fiscal year. Um, that is, are you listening? About 20 hours a week. I know you, so I'm going to kind of hold you to that. Um, she's still a full-time wife and mother um, and has a few other teaching duties, and then we'll reevaluate after that. Um, but uh, obviously she's a very dedicated member here at church as well, okay? Any other further questions on that? We are very blessed to have her. She's been in our monthly staff meetings really for the last two years and has been a great joy uh, to have with us uh, and brings another perspective and opportunity for works of service, for care, and for mercy within our congregation and outside these walls as well, okay? Now, we need to do something... When a, when a pastor gets ordained, he gets these things called stoles. You've seen them, right? We wear them every Sunday, uh, that a pastor now will wear these stoles for the first time uh, with a deaconess, with every kind of, help me out here, Dr. Busher, with, with the various man-made offices in the church. Usually, there's a little bit of a ceremony or something that is unique um, that they receive that they haven't had before. And so she's explained already her patch. Go ahead and turn your shoulder again. So this is now her full-fledged, full-color deaconess patch. But there's one other thing that takes place that you get to be a part of today, and that's known as a pinning ceremony, okay? Similar to a white coating ceremony for some of you that are medical doctors, a pinning ceremony for a deaconess uh, is a very important thing. And we have just the guy here today to actually do uh, the pinning. I would love for you to do the pinning ceremony um, as uh, one of her beloved professors and director. Uh, of uh, diaconal studies at Concordia Fort Wayne. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Busher real quick. He can uh, tell you a few more things, and then he's going to uh, put the pin on the lapel of uh, Deaconess Sukula's jacket. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the pinning. I'm not sure what the uh, formal <laughs> things that are said, but glad to do it for, for Jen. 
Uh, I, you know, as you've already heard, I don't have to say too much. You're getting a wonderful, as you already know, probably better than I do, a wonderful lady as your deaconess. Uh, I was just thinking, I'm very sad that she's not going to be in our program anymore. She's been an excellent student, probably one of the very best students we've had. Uh, I, don't, I, I would never say anybody's the best. It's hard to say that. But uh, she certainly has been at the very top and, so, uh, and has been wonderful, not only as a student. She's already recruiting for us with her daughter. I think we've already kind of counted her as part of the program. And uh, I think she wants to come back. She keeps saying she wants to come back to the seminary. So we're happy about that, but certainly thrilled today to be able to call her by a new title, which is Deaconess. Uh, and uh, she kind of explained the way I usually just kind of put it briefly. A deaconess is kind of driven by two things. And you heard both of them in, in Jen's uh, presentation. One is, of course, the gospel, right? The love of God for humanity. Uh, and the love He has for all of us, in which He sent His only begotten Son, uh, who came not to be served, but to serve, right? In fact, that little word serve is where we get the word deaconess from, diakonia. He came to give up everything for us. So that's the first thing that, that drives the deaconess vocation. The second one, I think you've also heard in her presentation, is it's driven by the needs of our neighbor, right? The needs that we see around us. Uh, pastor did a nice job kind of emphasizing that. He saw the need in the elderly community or those getting older in the professionals group. But this is what we try to talk to deaconesses about, is perceiving the needs that we see around us in our community, the needs of our neighbor that are there, those who are suffering. Uh, you can kind of see it in Matthew 25, right? Jesus has identified himself with the needy ones. Uh, so he says, when I was in prison, you came and visited me, right? If you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And that's really what the deaconess vocation seeks to facilitate in the church. That The church is also perceiving uh, the needs of the neighbor and, and bringing them into communion with Christ where there's, where there's real help, where there's real joy. So, uh, Jen, it's been great to have you a student, but uh, especially... Uh, just very proud to call you deaconess now. So, uh, where is the pen after all? Okay. So, I'm not, I, this is going to be a joke in trying to get this to go on. So, maybe I'll let you, I don't even know either, but uh, does it go on the side maybe? Yeah, we'll try to get it in there. Right. Okay, actually, I think that got on there. It's kind of on there. So, congratulations. <laughs> right. uh, welcome. <laughs> Before we uh, close uh, here with prayer, uh, just a, a couple of acknowledgments. And, and Dr. Busher, if you could take this back to the seminary, what I'm about to say. The students at seminary oftentimes receive uh, awards, uh, awards, recognitions. And in the parish, we don't always hear about that unless the students tell us about it. And so just real quick before I come back to you, our own Reverend Aaron Schultz received a very prestigious award and a monetary gift, correct? Yeah, you did, through the Lutheran Concerns Association and through the, the foundation. Oh, I heard about it. I don't know why you're not, okay. So he received a wonderful award uh, as a, a seminary student and then our own uh, deaconess, Jen Sukula, there is a special award that you received that a couple of people here know about and I actually had one person come up and say, are we going to hear about this award that she received? And what is it? What was the award? You don't have your microphone. You're not, <laughs> you see, so humble, she, Dr. She, Busher. She received the Elizabeth Fetty Award, which goes, we give two of them, one to a distant student, one to a residential student, which is basically the, the uh, best student in each of those uh, for the year, those that uh, are a model deaconess and that uh, have performed excellently academically, typically the highest academically, but also uh, in their service to the church, their practical service. So it recognizes that kind of holistic uh, vocation of our students and uh, uh, Jennifer uh, received that award. Elizabeth Fetty, by the way, one of the early deaconesses that ministered to Lutherans in the United States. 
In fact, we still have a hospital, there's still a hospital in New York that she started, actually, when she worked among the Norwegian Lutherans in New York. She even was one of the first, maybe the first, to have an ambulance system that actually took care of, uh, of the sick. So she was, and then she went to Minnesota and started a hospital. So she was a significant figure uh, in kind of the beginnings of diaconia and the deaconess vocation in America. So we named the, uh, the award after her, and uh, uh, Jennifer was uh, an excellent uh, kind of recipient of that award. So. Yeah. Okay, thanks be to God. Any other closing questions or comments? There's still a deaconess uh, lemon blueberry cake in the back to eat at Donuts. Don't forget about our uh, annual church picnic. You see everything set up outside. Uh, Children, youth, and a few others have been busy doing something that is going to be done to your poor pastors later on. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, but uh, And then we've got divine service here for the second time this morning. So anything else? You, you took your mic off and you're done. I know you too well. Dr. Busher, since you are our wonderful uh, guest here today, would you mind closing us with prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give thanks that your mercies are new to us every morning. We especially give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin and came to give His life, lay down His life for us all, and to give us the joy of the resurrection and its salvation in Him. Lord, we pray that You would send Your Spirit, that we may ever rejoice in the salvation that is ours, but also send Your Spirit that we might also become instruments of His joy and His mercy as we love and serve one another. Toward this end, we give you thanks for Jennifer and for all the servants that you bestow upon your church. And we pray that you would bless them so that all that they do might be pleasing in your sight. We pray that you would bless also your church through them and through pastors, that all that we do, uh, begun, continued, and ended in you, might be pleasing in your sight. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.